Today we are in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 45, reading from verse 16. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them he gave a change of clothes, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Apart from Jesus himself, Joseph is one of the best biblical examples we have of how to act and how to behave in ways which show the world what grace really means. We know his story very well. We're all familiar with the story of Joseph. And if anyone had a, a reason to become bitter and angry, surely it would have been Joseph. But he showed remarkable grace when it really mattered. His brothers were jealous of him. They sold him to some travelers and he became a slave in Egypt. He was falsely accused and thrown into prison and he was there for a number of years. While in prison, he helped some influential people who promised them to speak to Pharaoh on his behalf, but they didn't, and so he remained there for another two years. But all the time, when you read the story of Joseph, there was no hint of bitterness or a, a desire for revenge. How does a person do that? Because, as we well know, that doesn't come naturally. Part of the answer is that it is only when we have received grace and truly experienced it and allowed that grace to penetrate our hearts and our minds, that we are then able to exercise and show grace to, to others, ourselves. Satan doesn't want us to know about this, but God has clearly revealed this in Scripture. In fact, he's commanded us to do it. And in this passage, and there are many others, he has given us an example of somebody who did this, who received grace and then, and then shared it. And ultimately, through all of this, God was glorified. And he receives the honor. The whole story of Joseph's meeting with his brothers is a story of grace. And it could have been an awful episode of revenge and recriminations. We have to remember that Joseph was the second most powerful man in Egypt. And he quite literally had the power of death and life in his hands. He could have had his brothers executed. And it would have been quite legal, but he chose not to. So what can we learn from the story of Joseph, and, and what does it really mean to us? We have rejected God, but in his grace, he sent Jesus to reconcile us to himself. We are deserving of death because of our sin, but in grace, God has offered us the hand of reconciliation. Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. God has always known us. He recognized us. But in our sin, we were incapable of seeing Jesus for whom he really is. Just think about it. Why is the name of Jesus mocked and ridiculed so much in the world? Part of the answer is in John chapter 1, verse from, verses 10 and 11. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. People just don't understand who Jesus is. Just like Joseph and his brothers, sinners cannot recognize Christ for who he really is without the Spirit of God actually opening our eyes to the reality and us seeing just who this person is. Had Jesus not acted in grace and not chosen to reveal himself to us, 
We could never have known him. We could never have understood him on our own. We could know that there, there is a God. We see the, the, the evidence all around us. But we wouldn't know his name. We wouldn't know what he was like. We wouldn't know his will for our lives. Like Joseph, Jesus could have spoken the word and just exacted revenge on his enemies. But he acted in grace instead. And in Genesis 45 verse 4, Joseph says something to, says something to his brothers which echoes the words of God perfectly. Come near to me, please. This is the amazing invitation which God makes to us. The story of Joseph and his brothers is not just an historical story. It's the story of God's grace shown to all sinners. We are like Joseph's brothers in that we are guilty before the king. But we are shown grace instead of the punishment that we deserve. Jesus is the one who calls us to come near to him in fellowship. In spite of all the wrong that we've done. That, that's what grace is really all about. There's also a lesson here about how we are supposed to act when we are mistreated. We are not to return evil for evil or fight fire with fire. The Bible teaches that as believers we are to take a different approach. Joseph had already done so much for his brothers. Had he left it there and said, I forgive you, now you can all go home. They would have lived happily ever after. But Joseph goes another step further. He says to them, go and fetch your father, your wives and your children and bring them here. Come and live in Egypt. What does God say to us through Jesus? Go and tell your fathers, your mothers, your children about me. Go and fetch them and bring them here. Bring them to live with me. It, it's, it's a call to evangelism. Verses 19 and 20 again. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods for all the best of the land of Egypt is yours. This is so similar to what God is saying to us. Don't worry about the things of the world. They won't last and you won't need them in eternity. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, can you imagine the excitement in the brothers' voices when they finally got back to Jacob? Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. Are we excited when we tell others Jesus is alive? In fact, he is ruler over all. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do we have that same enthusiasm to tell people about this hope which they have? Joseph gave his brothers the best of Egypt, and he promised to always provide for them. And God does exactly the same for us, only it is infinitely greater. He has blessed us, and he has shown undeserved grace to us. Everything that we have in life is from him. The very fact that we woke up this morning is an act of his grace. And there's more to come. There's more to come in this life, and there's infinitely more to come in eternity. God's grace is sufficient for us. The way that Joseph chose to treat his brothers when he would have been fully justified in having them put to death is a wonderful picture of God's grace. The way God has chosen to treat us when he would be fully justified in having us put to death is infinitely higher than what Joseph did. 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The NRV translation says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Our task in the meantime is to learn, with God's help, how to forgive as Joseph did. To forgive as God has forgiven us. And all the while to seek the kingdom of God and to seek his righteousness. It is as we share that same enthusiasm and the same joy which God has given to us with others that we can actually start making a difference in the world. People need to know that there is hope. They don't need to die in their sins. If they turn to Christ in repentance, there is hope and there is joy because God calls us to come and live with him. So shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this indescribable gift of grace and mercy you've shown to us. We don't understand the depth of our sin. We don't understand just how much you have done for us. But yet you call us. You call us to come and live with you, both in this life and into eternity. 
And you've called us, your church, to extend that invitation, to extend that grace to others around us. And so, Father, give us a heart for the lost. At the same time, teach us what it means to forgive as we have been forgiven. We carry so many burdens around. And all it, all it takes is to turn to you in, in, in repentance and to remember what you have done. And so, Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts. We thank you for the, the, the peace of knowing who you are. Thank you for sending Christ our Savior. And it is in him and through him alone that we have this grace and this mercy. And for that we give you thanks. Amen.